Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sally Aiken, and I'm a professor and associate dean of research and innovation in the Faculty of Forestry at UBC. Uh, thanks for joining us here this morning. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that UBC's Vancouver campus is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I know that many of you are calling in from other areas near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of the lands where you are. So on behalf of the faculty, uh, I just want to say welcome. We're so glad you could join us today. Whether you're joining us from uh, within British Columbia, from other parts of Canada, or elsewhere in the world, uh, we're really happy to be able to offer uh, this online seminar and have you uh, join in with us. So that's been one of the few good things about the pandemic, is being able to reach people uh, through virtual presentations like this one today. So a little bit of housekeeping uh, before we get started. If you're experiencing any audio or vis video issues, you can use the live chat feature in the GoToWebinar box for assistance, and we have people standing by to help. So uh, let's get started on today's topic. So any forester will tell you that different trees have different values, um, but we tend to focus on the above ground portion of trees to consider what those, what those values are. And what if, uh, a lot of that value exists below ground. And so that's the central question of the Mother Tree Project uh, that is providing scientific data to help us manage forests better in a changing climate. And uh, it's uh, my pleasure to have Suzanne Samard here today. So Professor S uh, Samard is the director of the Mother Tree Project, and she's been researching below ground connections uh, amongst Douglas fir and, and other species for over 30 years, dating back to her PhD work in, in Oregon, which is I think back uh, when, when one of the times that we crossed paths, Suzanne, one of the many times. So mm -hmm. mother trees are typically the biggest trees in the forest and they connect to other trees via vast underground mycorrhizal networks. And these networks let uh, trees share resources and even transmit uh, information about potential threats. So mother trees also support regeneration by providing resources to seedlings. Suzanne's research, research has shown that trees become more dependent on mycorrhizal networks when they are stressed, such as in hotter and drier climates. So the Mother Tree Project is experimenting with a range of forestry practices in different climatic regions to learn how to create more resilient forests for the future. And we know that management of some of our driest forest types has been in the news lately as a major issue. So in this webinar, Suzanne will provide updates from the latest research in her Mother Tree Project, including an overview of the project's uh, locations throughout British Columbia and the design of the project, the use of space for time theory, uh, substituting spatial variation for changes in climate over time, the behavior of mother trees towards genetically re related and also unrelated seedlings, and the impact of drier climates on Douglas fir forests in particular. And she'll, she's also looking at how clear cutting and partial harvesting silvicultural systems affects carbon storage and diversity. So uh, by the end of this seminar, you'll have a better understanding of the role of mother trees and the advantages of retaining them during harvest. So with that, I'd like to give you a bit of background on, on uh, Suzanne's uh, professional work. So she is a professor of forest ecology and she has a PhD and a master's degree in forest ecology from Oregon State University and her uh, Bachelor of Science in Forestry degree is from UBC. And she's been a registered professional forester in British Columbia since 1986. She's published over 200 articles and she's presented at conferences around the world. Uh, she has communicated with a wide range uh, of people uh, throughout the world through interviews, documentary films, and her TED talk. And her upcoming book, Finding the Mother Tree will be published in 2021. So we really appreciate you joining us today, Suzanne. Thank you. 
So if you could go to the next slide. I just want to tell you how you'll be able to ask Suzanne questions during the presentation. So we're using the Slido platform, uh, which works very well. Uh, you have instructions in your reminder email for the webinar, but uh, basically what you do is go to slido.com, you enter the code UBC Forestry, and uh, then you'll see instructions on the, on the screen. You can ask questions there and you can vote on the questions that other people have asked. And I will be taking the questions that have the most votes and uh, asking Suzanne those at the end of her presentation. So now I'd like to turn things over to Suzanne. Thank you, Thank Suzanne. You, Thank you, thank you for that generous introduction. Um, I just wanna start by uh, dedicating this talk to my great uncle, Joe Gardner. Um, many of you will have remembered Joe. He was the Dean of Forestry um, at UBC between 1965 and 1983. And this is a picture on the left of my grandfather, my Grandpa Bert and Uncle Joe. Um, he was, Joe was born in 1919 in the cusp. And on the right picture is the cusp around that time. Um, actually, Uncle Joe was the, the ninth of, of nine children and his mom, my great grandmother, um, was quite, she was almost 50 when she had Joe. And so my grandfather and my grandmother, Granny Winnie, um, kind of brought up, helped bring up Uncle Joe. And uh, so here he is as a young man uh, on his way to UBC actually, where he studied forestry and then went on to get his PhD at McGill. And I've included this picture down below of Nacusp in 1919 because, you know, Nacusp was, it's a, still a very tiny town, but he grew up in this tiny place in the forest um, and he, you know, at that time, the only transportation to Nacusp was by paddle wheeler. And uh, so he, in order to get to UBC, he had to take the Minto up to Revelstoke and then catch the train to Vancouver where he stayed with his sister, Auntie Amy, uh, while, while he went to UBC. And um, so this was a big leap for a guy from Nacusp. And I, I have to say, I think that he brought this worldly, this small world perspective to being the Dean. Um, and I think that those of you who remember Uncle, Do Uncle Joe, he had this big booming voice as all the gardeners did of that generation, but it was a kind voice and Uncle Joe loved people and he loved students. And I think those of us who were undergrads at that time of which I was one, um, uh, remember him teaching us as first year students about forestry and his big perspective and how, and how he welcomed us and made us feel like we belonged. So I just say hats off to Uncle Joe. He, he actually um, was indicted into the Order of Canada, this little guy from the cusp, actually he was a tall guy, but um, it's quite an accomplishment and I'm very proud of him and I'm proud to um, have followed in his footsteps. So talking about the Mother Tree Project, this, this is a, a picture of the ICH forest um, and this is the Adams River. And uh, these are salmon rivers and salmon forests. And uh, the, the, the Douglas fir forest, dominated forests, range from these very productive interior cedar hemlock forests with many species um, to, uh, to dry forests um, that you know, cover a full range of climatic conditions and make it really a great place to study climate effects um, on, uh, on all kinds of forest processes and structures and, and also the uh, what our management practices, how they are inter interacting with climate. And so I, I took advantage of this variability to conduct this experiment. So I'll explain that as I, as I go along, that, that, that variability in climate. Um, and, you know, as I grew up in British Columbia, um, going through, you know, at the time when Uncle Joe was the Dean and you know, all these changes that were going on and climate was starting to change even though we didn't know about it then, or we didn't, you know, hadn't come into our consciousness. There were things happening on the landscape that were indicators. And, you know, as a young forester, I was watching these things and it really helped formulate, you know, the questions I went on to ask eventually. Uh, this is just a picture by Lorraine McLaughlin of, uh, of the mountain pine beetle infecting or infesting a forest in the subboreal spruce zone where pine had been planted and uh, is kind of off site and very at risk. And uh, of course it got mailed, but so did many other things. And as you know, you know, plantations 
natural forests and not just the mountain pine beetle, but I was observing at that time in the late 80s and 90s that there was a lot of root disease and uh, Western gall rust and all kinds of things coming into these plantations. And I really wanted to understand as a researcher then, why? Why were our forests under so much stress? And why was, you know, not knowing that climate was causing a lot of the underlying stress was what were we doing that might actually accelerate that or amplify it? And I was interested in the below ground world because I was interested in root disease especially. And, um, and so it was these sort of formulative ideas that came to me to, uh, to do this study. Um, and that is how can we better manage our forests to mitigate climate change and losses in biodiversity? And as I talk about this project, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the framework of, of, of the basic understanding that went into it, the design of the project and give you some early results. Okay, um, I also wanna mention I had that this year has been a special year because, because of COVID. And you know, normally I've had lots of students working on this project. It started in 19, or 2015 and there's been dozens of students working, but this year was special in, in that COVID was here. And so, um, we couldn't get the students in the field at first. And um, actually Sally was extremely instrumental in helping us um, to get the approvals in order to get people going and get us in the field. But we started out in, in our offices doing literature reviews for the first two months while you know, we sort of watched how COVID would happen. And so I, you know, the students were kind of grumbly at first because who wants to do a literature review right after they finish school? Um, but they did it, and I got an invitation to actually write a paper that would, you know, incorporate these literature reviews and publish it. And so what I've done is once they got in the field and collected the data on the things they were studying, we were able to integrate their literature reviews with the data they collected, and we just submitted the paper today. So here's this, you know, they're all going to be on this, their first journal paper, which has been super exciting for all of us. Okay, so I mentioned the wetter forests, um, but really, you know, the, the project encompasses not just the wet ICH forest, but Douglas fir dominated forests in the dry belt as well. So it, all the way from the dry to the wet, with the idea that if we study the range of climates and responses to the range of climates, then we can use that as a space for time substitute for projecting or helping us understand as climate changes, what practices we might start to adopt. Um, in the future. Um, so I talked about, you know, the below ground world has fascinated me and in my endeavors to understand root disease and diseases in our forests, I started looking below ground and I became fascinated during my PhD, not just in how pathogens affected forests, but all, all the other groups of fungi in forests that affect uh, our for the structure and function of forests. And this includes the mycorrhizal fungi. And so this is an amanita actually. My, mycorrhizas are, their fruiting bodies are those really colorful big mushrooms that you see in the forest. Um, there's different kinds of mycorrhizas. Um, the main group I was, I've been working in, it's called ectomycorrhizas. And uh, so I was interested in how these ectomycorrhizas might interact with our malaria. Um, but in my endeavors to do that, I've quickly learned about this fascinating work in the UK where um, David Reed and his colleagues had in the laboratory had found that mycorrhizal fungi, that the mycelium of these fungi for one is huge. And you can see in this little picture of these pine seedlings growing in this little root box, the mycelium, you know, the biomass in that mycelium is far greater than that which is in the seedling or shoots themselves. And most fascinating to me was that the mycelium actually connected these individual seedlings together in a network, which completely turned up upside down my view and how I thought we viewed trees and forests as individuals that were competitors. And here, David Reed is showing actually they're connected together, and he actually used carbon-14 to see that carbon actually moves back and forth between these seedlings. And so I wondered, well, if this happens in the lab, does it really happen in forest too. Um, this picture just shows a couple of root tips of pine seedlings and they're linked together by these hyphal mycelium. I, I'm just showing you this because it's, 
it's even though you can't often see it when you pull back the force where sometimes you can see the mycelium but mostly these things are invisible to our eyes and yet you know when people actually count the length of these mycelium that are linking trees together there are thousands and thousands of kilometers in a in a forest beneath your feet of these linkages that combine trees into a whole and so um through the course of having graduate students, I was so fortunate to work with so many great people. Um, we asked so many questions. And one of the important questions we asked or that we looked at was, what does this network look like in a real forest? And of course, you can't, when they're invisible, you can't really see it. So we had to bring to bear on it molecular tools to, to unravel the forest. So this is a study done by Kevin Byler um, and some other colleagues where Kevin went into six Douglas fir forests and he basically peeled back the forest floor and collected the DNA of every bit of fungal material he could find, as well as the cambium of the Douglas fir trees in this, this IDF forest. And he was able to determine or identify individuals of fungi and trees. And so in this picture, these circles, these green circles represent the trees and the, the, the lines represent the, the fungi. And what Kevin found was that individual fungi were shared between different trees and therefore connected them together. And in making his maps of, of these networks of fungi, he found out that every tree was linked to every other tree. And there's many stories within this figure, but um, this is just a 30 by 30 meter forest. You can see certain things like the big trees, which are the biggest circles, and the oldest trees, which are the darkest circles, are the ones that are the most highly connected. And so there's a single tree in here that is actually linked to 49 other trees. Um, and in fact, every tree is linked to every other tree through a series of hop, skips, and jumps from tree to tree. Another important thing to notice is that the little trees, which are the yellow circles, um, are have regenerated within the network of these old trees. And so when a seed falls on the floor, forest floor, uh, a hypocotyl goes down into the forest floor starts to you know, look for nutrients and water while it's expanding its cotyledons to start to photosynthesize. And as it, do, as, the, as it does that, the network of the other trees signal that new root and they join into a, a symbiosis. And that in that symbiosis then, the old trees provide the network with carbon and some of that carbon ends up in the little seedlings to support them while they're getting established. Um, what the tree gets in return from the mycelium is that it is um, you know, also exploring the soil, soil for nutrients and water and bringing them back to the tree in this exchange, this mutualistic exchange. So the young seedlings are generating and regenerating in the networks of the old trees. Every tree is linked to every other tree. And it you know, begs many questions of, for example, whether or not these old trees can recognize which seedlings are of their own seed or their own kin. And so I've done a series of experiments with my students to show that actually these old trees can recognize seedlings of their, that are their relatives, and they adjust their competitive and mutualistic behaviors to make room for those seedlings, or if the environment is not conducive to their regeneration, to outcompete them. And so there is this intricate understanding or, or communication and interaction going on between these old trees and the young ones coming up. And that recognition of their relatives, we call that kin recognition. Um, other things that we did, um, many things, but we wanted to understand the functionality of, of that, those connections between, of the mycorrhizal connections. And we found that uh, when we labeled trees with nitrogen or phosphorus or carbon, water, deuterated water, we found that, that these resources move back and forth between the trees. And the more one, one tree was shaded or stressed, the more that would move uh, from the healthy to the stressed individual. Also, if one tree was um, uh, attacked by an insect, and we worked a lot with uh, Western spruce budworm, um, that stress that was associated with that tree caused it to dump a lot of carbon into its rhizosphere and then transmit that carbon to its neighbor, which would then increase its own resilience. And uh, when we challenged those trees with the budworm again, they were more resistant to that budworm. And so we looked even deeper and found that they transmitted not only carbon, but also defense enzymes. And so there's this communication and information sharing that showed that this ecosystem really was a whole connected you know, system where each individual was interacting very intimately with its neighbors. 
of course, this is not the way that we've conducted forestry generally. I think we've, you know, we've more viewed trees as individuals where we want to manage their competitors, and that has led to all kinds of uh, nuances in our forestry practices. So, for example, you know, spacing and how we plant and how we um, weed and thin are all based on the idea that we need to manage the competition. But my premise is that there's not just competition going on in these forests, there's also these mutualisms and cooperation. And maybe we should look at the whole suite of, of interactions and the multiplicity of how trees interact with each other. And that's what gave rise to the Mother Tree Project. How can we do things differently other than clear cut, plant, and then manage the competition? And so the Mother Tree Project was launched in 2015 with NSERC funding. And since then, um, I've been collaborating with a wide array of uh, large licensees, small licensees, community forests, First Nations to create this project. Okay, so the objective is the project of the project is how do we design forest renewal practices uh, that is the harvesting and planting so that we can maintain biodiversity, carbon storage, and foster regeneration as climate changes? How do we create resilient forests as climate changes, in other words? And it has three basic factors it's looking at. One is a climate gradient. Second is retaining these old trees. We call them mother trees because of their nurturing capabilities. It's more of a colloquial name than a scientific name, but that's what we call them. And thirdly, uh, we wanted to look at a seedling genetic gradient. So as climate changes, do we assist migration of certain genotypes so that they're better adapted to the future climates? So I'll explain how all, we incorporated all these three things in our design. So basically those three factors um, is, are replicated um, across nine forests in, in British Columbia, and each forest has got three replicates um, of these particular treatments. So, so one of them is climate. Um, and so our climate gradient ranges from a temperature gradient from 2.3 to 8 degrees Celsius, uh, temp, um, a big range of precipitation and uh, aridity. Um, and within each one of those climate regions, of which there are three forests each, we have five harvesting treatments that represent um, retention of old trees in different amounts and configurations, from a control forest where we have 100% retention to 60% uh, retention where we retain these trees um, in patches but thin from below, a 30% retention, so smaller uh, patches left and, and larger gaps opened up, and then single tree retention or seed tree compared with clear cutting. And then our third factor is genotype, where we are, have planted a range of Douglas fir genotypes in these forests um, from drier provenances to wetter provenances so that we can re re develop some response functions um, so how, looking at how these different genotypes interact with overstory trees and how that might change their response functions. So this next picture is just a map of the location of our forests. You can see they're widely distributed across the whole distribution of the of Douglas fir, including on at Malka Map Research Forest, which of course is coastal Douglas fir. But we were mostly focused on the interior forests. And these varied in how they, they looked, of course, because their precipitation and temperature varied. So, you know, we were very pleased we got the most northern tip of the distribution at John Prince Research Forest, sort of a northern latitude um, forest in Alex Fraser Research Forest, uh, Malcolm Knapp Research Forest, and then a bunch of forests that are drier and wetter than those. So a wide range of climates. And um, this figure just shows that that climate gradient that we were able to establish our project on really reflected the very strong uh, relationship with Douglas fir site index, which is, as you all know, is an indicator of productivity of Douglas fir. And so we felt that we had a very good representation of the range of, of, of uh, site capabilities for Douglas fir in our experiment. I mentioned that there's lots of students involved and you can see why with this is a very labor intensive project. So with, with nine forests and three reps and five treatments, there are literally hundreds of patches of land that we are looking at and observing in different ways. Um, and we use what a overall protocol for, called the National Forest Inventory, where we're looking at tree growth. Um, we're measuring all the plants and the forest floor, the slash, 
Uh, we're collecting plants and mushrooms and, and soils and uh, hauling bags and bags of soil and litter and uh, forest floor and branches and plants out to dry them, weigh them, and do nutrient and carbon analysis on them in the lab. Um, so we went in prior to all of the harvesting and did a whole bunch of pretreatment measurements on this. Then the licensees and our partners did the harvesting in conjunction with us. Um, and then immediately after the harvesting, we planted our seedlings, which we had planted at, or grown at the uh, Pacific Region Technologies Greenhouse in Nelson. Our wide variety of Douglas fir genotypes along with larch and ponderosa pine and, and, uh, and lodgepole pine. So we had a mix of dug for genotypes and a mix of different species planted in one hectare measurement plots in the middle of these five hectare blocks of our harvesting treatments. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the results that we found. First, I'm going to look at the climate effects. And so first thing that we wanted to know was what are the natural patterns in these forests? And one of the patterns is how does uh, diversity change across this climate gradient? So one of the main indicators is tree species richness. And we found this very strong relationship between tree richness and climate. So declining richness with climate aridity. And this has you know, been found in other studies around the world. So it was, it was gratifying for us to be able to see this. But of course, you know, the tree species richness doesn't necessarily always reflect what's going on in the understory. And so while tree species richness was declining, what we found was that overall, when we take into account the herbs and the shrubs, that actually the drier forests, when we total up all the different plants, are the most rich of, the, of these forests. And so these different plants have different functionalities that we don't all understand what they are. Um, I'm going to move on from that. So the other thing that we looked at was carbon stocks. So as species diversity was increasing with aridity, um, carbon stocks were declining with climate aridity. And this also has been borne out in other studies around the world. And so our wettest forests have, you know, substantially more carbon in them than our dry forests. And uh, this picture just shows the distribution of that carbon. Um, from the wettest forest, which is Mal Malcolm Knapp on the left, all the way up to the driest forest on, on the other end of the curve. And there's a couple of things I want you to notice here. First of all, about half of the carbon in all of these forests is below ground. Only half of what you see when you're walking in the forest is, is above ground. The other half is in the forest floor and the roots and the, and the mineral soil. So that to me, even to me, is astounding. Um, and then the second thing I want you to notice here is that See the wet forest, there's about seven, 600 megagrams of, of carbon in these wetter forests at Malcolm Knapp, which is about three times as much as in the dry forests. And so when we're thinking of conservation strategies from a, from a carbon point of view and a biodiversity point of view, then we can start to make decisions about where we should be conserving forests. And I have to say that what we do now is actually kind of the opposite of what, probably what we're doing if we were smarter about this where our coastal forests, including Haida Gwaii, Vancouver Island, and so on, should be the forests where, if we're thinking of carbon and, and tree diversity, we should be focused in conservation on those first. This is just a figure showing the balance between above and below ground uh, carbon. And, you know, a lot of people talk, or we know that, you know, trees will allocate resources to get the limiting factors or the limiting resources. And so they allocate more carbon below ground in drier climates. And we do see this does happen in our forests as well. Um, I'm going to skip over that. And so the second thing uh, I wanted to ask, which many people have looked at around the world as well, is how is carbon related to biodiversity? And many of you will re remember the work of David Tillman over the many years when he had some very famous experiments, not with trees, but with uh, herbaceous plants, and finding that as species richness increased or diversity increased that ecosystem productivity also increased. Um, but there is of course a flattening off of the curve as some species become or more similar or have overlapping niche space. Um, and so functionality kind of you know, levels off. I wanted to know, is that true in our forest too? Could I test that idea in our forest? And I wanted to build upon some work done um, by IUFRO and the uh, World Forestry Congress looking at these relationships in trees. 
and you know in looking you know there's not that many old experiments to actually test these ideas and that was surprising to me too there aren't that many studies out there um, but generally what the trends show is that yes indeed even in forests just like in Tillman's grasslands um, that as tree diversity goes up so does uh, ecosystem function or growth or biomass or carbon increment and so when we asked that question with our data we found that yeah as tree species richness goes up, so does ecosystem carbon go up. So those relationships really hold. And this figure down below, I, I thought was really interesting because this is just carbon, ecosystem carbon versus tree richness. And you can see in our driest forests, you know, carbon is quite low and flat, um, but there's a threshold of about two species per hectare where suddenly you see this increase in, in carbon in a big way. And I think that this really is instructive in us when we're thinking about you know, carbon storage and strategies for carbon storage that multi-species of forests do store more carbon because there are more niche spaces that are occupied and they're able to access a greater number of resources to support leaf area and carbon fixation. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is some early results on our harvesting treatments. Um, and just to go over what they look like, this is our control. This is a 60% retention with thinning from below, 30% um, patch retention, seed tree, and clear cut. And um, this is just an aerial view of, uh, of the Malcolm Knapp study site. And you can see the different treatments here. We have clear cut, 30% retention, seed tree, uh, uncut control down here, 60% retention. So they're very they're very different and they're very visible and very obviously uh, dramatic treatments. So um, here's our first data. So this is one year post-treatment looking at the carbon budget. What happened to the carbon when we harvested the forest? Well, the first thing that you'll notice is that, well, the more trees you take off, the, lower, the less carbon there is left above ground. That's a no brainer. Um, but basically, you know, what you're left with after harvesting and clear cutting is, is what's in the below ground community. Um, and I think the other important thing to notice here is that if you look at the forest floor, which is where most of the below ground carbon is stored, but we actually lost 60% of the forest floor carbon with harvesting. And it didn't matter how we harvested, whether it was clear cutting or these large patch retentions, that what we do to extract those trees, and if, we, if we're moving soil and gouging soil and uh, digging up tree roots, that has a huge impact on the carbon budget. And so this is an area where I can immediately say is that we can do a lot better with this. Um, worldwide, th those losses in the forest floor uh, in forestry practice is only 30%. So in British Columbia, we're exceptional in that we're losing a lot more. And so this is an area where I think that we uh, need to do some more research and thinking about. Okay. Um, so the other thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, and this is, this figure is actually in the opposite direction. We've got our clear cut on the left instead of the right. And you can see that, you know, just like carbon, um, as we cut our forests, um, we also lose biodiversity. That's been shown around the world. It's no exception here. We especially lose our moss species. Um, um, and, but I want, what I wanted to, you know, pay more attention to is, um, the regeneration that we're that our students are looking at right now in such great detail and you can see that you know the more trees that are retained and this is at one of our sites redfish near nelson um you can see that the more trees that are retained the more the regeneration there is not just of shade tolerant species like hemlock and cedar but also douglas fir and um you know the this most of this regeneration occurs within 15 meters of the parent trees which is uh you know well borne out by literature as well. Um, and, and so that can speak to us about, you know, if we're going to retain trees, there's some guidance there. If we are focused on regeneration, which is one of our main indicators of recovery, then, then you know, leaving trees so that they're no more than about 15 meters apart will enhance regeneration according to our data. Okay, so um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about about the planted trees. So that was natural regeneration. And you know, going back to that figure again, just, just to emphasize, look at the numbers on this y-axis. I mean, we're getting huge regener natural regeneration. Even in the clear cut, we're up around 2,000, 2,500 stems per hectare. Um, 
ample natural regeneration. And yet, you know, we still plant all of our forests, um, which is a good insurance. But I would argue after looking at forests for a long time that these natural regen seedlings are will form a major part of our forests in the future. But um, even with our planted seedlings, we're starting to see some important results. So at Redfish, you can see that, you know, in the clear cut, we actually got the best survival. Um, but still, um, uh, we still got good survival in the in the high patch retentions. In our most northern site, this is John Prince, which is a much colder environment. We actually found that the more retention we had, the better the Douglas fir seedlings survived. And I think in those harsh environments where there's frost, um, there's just a lot more stresses in those seedlings than at Redfish, which is a more uh, moderate climate. That protection by these old trees um, is super helpful to planted seedlings as well, not just fostering re natural regeneration, but helping the planted seedlings along, along as well. And you know, noting that you know most of the, the silviculture systems we use in the north is still clear cut and plant, and yet you know we could do better with that too. Um, this figure just shows how you know the different genotypes of Douglas fir performed in different climates. Um, where the uh, local seed lots are the ones that are along the uh, x-axis at one. And you can see that there is a response curve where our local seedlings generally are doing best in their local climates. But what this figure is showing us is that even uh, we can also plant seedlings from slightly warmer climates and they'll do just about as well as the local seedlings. And so that bodes well for us to try to start moving some genotypes from warmer climates to cooler climates. The response isn't quite as good with precipitation, but even so, um, seedlings that are coming from slightly drier climates do as well as those from the local climates. In the uh, retention patches, there's an interaction between how these genotypes behave with, with overstory trees. And what we found in general is that uh, as we retain overstory trees, we're actually increasing the potential survivability of migrated genotypes by about 20 percent. So um, I want to say just you know in my final remarks here that you know this project and these ideas about retaining old trees is not just important for carbon and regeneration but also for fire, uh, fire resistance and fire risk in our forests which we are all uh, dealing with. And what we found in looking at fire risk in our different treatments is that fire risk actually goes down with increasing retention. It's because there's less slash on the ground and these old trees are actually more resistant to fire than young trees. So in conclusion, um, I just wanna say the forests are under current stress from the climate and also our management practices. Um, and part of the problem I feel is that we've missed the forest, the connectivity of the forest for just focusing on trees. And that um, retaining tree neighborhoods or legacy trees in clusters, especially in you know, smaller clusters, can help maintain biodiversity, store carbon, and enhance regeneration. And that this retention appears to be especially crucial on harsh sites. And I would venture a guess for in, as our climate changes into the future. And also that our retention patterns need to be based on our understanding of local conditions, that we can't do the same thing everywhere. You know, some places. The cutting might be appropriate, but you know, and seed trees will be more appropriate than patch retention. Um, but generally, I'd say you know we can encourage some retention, but we can use a variety of methods to, to do that. And this comes from research where we um, test things, and uh, you know, and this will help us educate ourselves and other people, and to validate our model models and motivate us, and provide some insurance for change. So I just want to say thanks for the Mother Tree Project and all the students, uh, and we're very grateful for, for you listening and for supporting our work as we go forward. So thanks so much. Thanks so much, Suzanne. That was a fantastic presentation. I'm sure that people are uh, sending you virtual applause from uh, all kinds of locations from our uh, hundreds of viewers today. So uh, Slido has been busy, people have been asking questions and uh, also voting on those questions. So again, if you want to uh, ask a question or vote, you can go to slido.com and use the code UBC forestry, but I'll get started with the uh, 
most popular questions here. And I'm going to have to suppress my own curiosity because I have a whole bunch of questions for you too, but uh, we, we can chat another time. Oh, and I did want to mention before, before we proceed that your uncle Joe Gardner, as you know, I was a student a year yeah. behind you when you were a student. He was dean then, and he yeah. was a remarkable man. So, and in fact, you called him Uncle Joe because he was your uncle, but all the students called him Uncle Joe because we were all so fond of him. So um, he's also the person who brought women into the undergraduate forestry programs at UBC. The previous dean had not allowed women to register as students. And when, uh, when Dean Gardner found out about that, when he started as dean, he quickly fixed that situation and uh, we saw just an explosion in the number of women students. So uh, yeah, thank I, you so much I, for, for sharing yeah. that experience. And the, I, I remember Uncle Joe was really proud of that, you know, that he was helped, helped women get into forestry. So yeah, thanks Uncle Joe. Yeah, so back to mother trees. Uh, so um, the top question here uh, asked by Randy, is are each of the tree species you studied equally connected underground or are some species better connectors than others? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm not sure that I totally know the answer, but um, uh, most of our conifer species, um, other than cedar, um, form ectomycorrhizas, of which there are thousands of species. Um, and most of these trees, hemlocks, dug firs, you know, dug fir especially, um, host many, many species each. So Douglas fir itself hosts thousands of ectomycorrhizal fungi. Some of them are generalist fungi, mean, meaning that they can, can, they can colonize many species of trees, and some are specific. Um, and they all have generalist fungi, hemlocks do, you know, the spruces. And, and so that means that they can all connect together. And really, it, it's more it's a matter of how many of these generalists that they will colonize, colonize with or enter in relationships with, um, but all of them have many of them and ample potential to connect. So it's really just a matter of, of um, you know, how, many, how big the root systems are, how many fine roots there are, and the more there are, the more root tips that are, have mycorrhizas that will connect with the other trees. So I'd say that size and age of the trees are more important than species. And in all the, you know, wherever I've looked at the different species, I find that they all connect to each other. I mentioned cedar. Cedar forms arbuscular mycorrhizas, which is a whole different uh, kind of mycorrhizal fungus. And there's only a few species in our forest of trees that form these. So the maples do, yew trees, cedars I mentioned, all, most of the herbaceous plants form arbuscular mycorrhizas. So they have their own network that is quite, that is separate than the ectomycorrhizal networks. So if you're in the ICH and there's like 10 species of conifers and if, most of them will be in their own ectomycorrhizal network and then the cedars and the maples and the yews will be in their own separate one. The huckleberries, they have another group called the ericoids and they're in their own network. And so you have all these different networks going on um, that many, many different species hook into. I hope that answers your question. Good, I, I think that that was a great answer. So uh, another one of the, the top questions from Anonymous here is how do I, we identify mother trees in the field so we can avoid cutting them down? Yeah, so just a, just a word about the word mother tree. <laughs> um, I mentioned that, you know, it, it, I think that the geneticist, Sally could comment on this, but the geneticist is probably going to think, oh my God, they're not, there's mothers and fathers out there. And for most species there, there are. Um, the reason we call them mother trees is because of this, you know, the, the findings that we've had that the, these networks really are important in regeneration of the forest. And that, you know, that through the mycorrhizal network that these trees can recognize their kin and nurture their own kin. And so it was really a filmmaker that really urged me to start calling these trees mother trees um, because people could understand what that meant. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and how do you tell which ones they are? Well, they're just the biggest trees in the forest. So, you know, they're the ones that are the most highly connected. They've got the biggest root systems. And so even in a, you know, a short forest, for example, or a young forest, you're still 
vertical stratification among trees. And so it's really just the biggest trees. And of course, forests are dynamic. We all know that. And so then some trees will become mother trees later in their life um, and, and eventually die out. And, and so there's always this changing status. Um, so it's a dynamic thing. It depends on the age and, uh, and the species that are dominant at that time of succession. Okay, good. So um, the next question is, are these findings relevant outside of Pacific Northwest forests, for example, European forests that are not primary forests? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is yes. Um, it's funny because I was just doing a podcast with some people in Wisconsin because, you know, people around the world are fascinated by these findings um, because, you know, it. I think that there's a, a sense, people have a sense that, that trees are, um, you know, intimately, they have intimate relationships. They grow up and live beside each other for hundreds, or hundreds of years, if not tens of years, whether you're in Europe or in Asia or in North America. Forests, you know, have these basic features um, of trees living a long time beside each other. Um, and, you know, people have looked at the possibility of networks in forests all around the world. And every time they look, they find that, you know, that that's a fundamental feature. Um, and so as long as there's mycorrhizal fungi and, you know, and all trees have got our hosts and they're obligate, they're in obligate relationships with, with mycorrhizas. They have to have them or they don't survive and reproduce. Um, as long as those networks are there, then the, the forest will be linked underground. I also wanted to mention, you know, I look at mycorrhizal fungal networks, but there are many other networks in forests, not just of fungi. So there's like, in addition to, you know, in the microbial community in forests, there's not just fungi, but there's micro, there are bacteria and archaea. And those bacterial, bacteria also form like biofilms and networks themselves. So along the surface of the mycorrhizal sphere or the, of the, the hyphae live like thousands and thousands of bacteria that are in communication with each other and um, which operate, basically operate the nu nutrient cycle and they feed off of the carbon that's being leaked out of the mycorrhizal network. And so they all have their own networks as well, which of course in all forests all around the world have those as well. Um, so I just want to mention that it, even above ground there are networks, you know. So the fungi are, are one example, but you know, I think thinking of the forest as a connected place to all these different functional groups is really important. And it really does change our view of how the forest works when we view it as a connected communicating system. So many linkages, but uh, uh, interesting to think about the commonalities and the potential for this. Uh, this kind of research in, in the many forest ecosystems that are out there. So uh, there's a question relating to harvesting here. And mm -hmm. uh, so you showed a huge loss of forest floor carbon after harvesting. How do we do a better job of retaining this forest floor carbon? Yeah, I think that's such a, it's a, a puzzle to me. I, it's a, you know, that result was so surprising. I didn't expect to see it at all. And, um, but when you're when we're out there measuring this, like so we car count carbon, like this picture I've got of Alyssa here holding carbon in her hand, basically. It's so when you're out there, you can see where the mistakes are made. Um, so anytime any kind of machinery is out there digging up forest floor, moving it around, putting it in brush piles, you know, creating trails, you're basically taking that rich carbon capital and putting it somewhere else or it, or you know, worst is putting it in these piles and burning it. Um, and, and so even though we, we have good standards for protecting mineral soil, I would say, when it comes to the forest floor, there's just, you know, we just need to figure out better ways to do this. You know, there are, you know, winter logging is one option. Um, uh, you know, having more careful skid trail patterns, um, reaching into the forest, um, you know, not all the forests we looked at had problems. The, you know, Malcolm Knapp, for example, did an amazing job with their carbon capital, but there are others where, you know, most of it got lost. And it's just not knowing that, that the damage can be done so easily and yet avoided also so easily. So I think that we really need to think hard about how to improve in that area. We can look around the world at what other people are doing, um, but this is one area where this is low hanging fruit for us. 
you know, and it also is, if we count carbon properly, it also is a big gap for us. So I think we need to fix this gap and uh, just, you know, doing simple things like, you know, better skid trails, um, avoiding any kind of, you know, gouging and displacement and uh, walking the ground instead of, you know, like machines that are out there and the operator doesn't ever get out of the machine is a mistake because they don't recognize that they've done something like that. Um, so we need better education and maybe better methods for being out there uh, and doing the practices. Yeah, getting out, getting out on the ground is is always <laughs> is always educational um, yeah. for whoever's operating <laughs> out there. So I'm going to use my uh, moderator prerogative to ask you a question uh, uh, to wrap things up. So. Uh, as you know, we're both very interested in in climate change and response of and response of of trees, both species and and uh, genetic different genetic populations to climate change. And we have this challenge of keeping what's in place local, but also looking down the road and and seeing um, some positive effects from shifting the composition of what's um, of what's on the ground, and and I realize your your experiment's a long-term one, and you won't have the final answers for what 10 years, 20, who knows? Long answers will keep coming in, but mm -hmm. but I'm curious how you see us resolving um, those two things, and and how and also how we can integrate natural and planted regen to solve some of these problems. Yeah, I think this is one of the most important questions, Sally. It's a great question, and I've thought about I've thought about it a lot. Um, so, you know, I think that one thing that we definitely can't do is, you know, try to remove our forests to make way for new forests that are going to be better adapted to the climate. It has to be a gradual, iterative approach where we use the forests that we have now to bootstrap and help along the new forests coming in. So these old trees, for example, they have lived through many climates and climate climatic changes. They harbor thousands of species of, of mutualists. Um, I mean, thinking of the tree as a microbiome, like it's not just an individual tree, it's, it's an association with many, many different species that are all playing a role in nutrient cycling and, and dealing with stress and communication and helping their neighbors or competing with their neighbors even. Um, and so these leaving these old trees to help the new ones along is going to be crucial, more crucial as climate changes. And so then as we're migrating seedlings into new areas, when they're young, that's their most vulnerable stage. And yeah, you're right, even though the project is 100 years old and will be yielding results for a long time, we're already seeing important impacts on different genotypes. And so, for example, moving in a drier a genotype from a drier and harder climate, that's a really vulnerable time because there's frost and there's other things that will get those seedlings when they're germinants and so, or when they're young seedlings. And so if you plant them in the neighborhood of old trees along with natural regeneration, and they're able to link into the network of these old trees and be boosted along by that existing community, I think they're going to have a much better chance at surviving. Whereas if we clear cut and make these open spaces that are, you know, don't have the networks in them or they've been very depleted and biodiversity has been depleted, um, that those migrated seedlings are going to have a much harder time. And so it can't be a blank slate. It's got to be working with the legacy of the old ecosystems to help you know, nurture and uh, move along the new ecosystem and help it change, right? That we're part of this too, as humans, we're gonna help these ecosystems adapt, but we need to use the, you know, the capital of the forest and the ingenuity of that forest already, the DNA diversity and that's already there to help the new ones along that are gonna be integrated into the new forest. I really think natural regeneration is a huge part of this story, that, that we should be fostering those, those local um, uh, seeds to um, build the foundation of the forest and into which we can fold into the new migrants that we want to introduce. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps answer that question. Yeah. No, that was great. And I think that diversity is just diversity in all of its shapes and forms is just going to be so important to um, yeah. helping uh, forests, not just trees, but helping forests adapt to new climates. So 
yeah, we should continue this this conversation over a coffee sometime, Suzanne, uh, or our many conversations. <laughs> so uh, with that, do you have yeah. any final um, takeaways that you would like to add to that before we close the seminar? Um, I think what I, I, you know, I after working so long with students in um, in these forests and that they really are the ones along with my colleagues, including Jean Roach and um, Brian Pickles, and people that are my Les Lavaklitch, who I've been collaborating with, the students are so fascinated by this and just love the work. And th this is their project. And uh, and I just want my hats off to them all. Um, and you know, I think that these kinds of projects where they can get in there and be part of it and be agents of change themselves um, is crucial to all of us, you know, evolving and developing as forestry, as the forest industry develops and evolves, that it is about our people and, and our students and giving them the opportunities to try these cool things and being part of the change. Yeah, so I guess that's my last word. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And I think we have many students on the line today, uh, on the on the call today, and uh, it's uh, it's going to take a lot of ingenuity and hard work and interest from them to uh, solve some of the problems that that our generation has created and generations before yeah. us so that's a great and note to end on yeah they have the energy and they have the smarts and they have you know they're amazing they'll do this we can we can meet this challenge for sure yeah so with that I would like to just give you a big thank you today, Suzanne, for a really interesting seminar, very thought provoking. And uh, I would like to thank all of you uh, all over the place who have joined us today. Uh, we've had great attendance, great questions. And so thanks to our students, alumni and friends who have joined the presentation. and. And during these times, uh, I encourage all of you to uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and if you and hopefully you can all stay healthy and get out and enjoy the forest. Uh, that's uh, one of the safest places that you can be right now. So have a great uh, rest of your day, and we look forward to you joining us for future webinars. Thank you. Thank you.